So it's great to see you tonight. Um, I am here to tell you that there is a way to build ourselves uh, out of the climate crisis and avoid climate disaster. Um, I don't know about you, but there are times when I read the latest article on climate change or how warm it's gotten, and this is another record month for warming, and the coral reefs are bleaching, and it just gets very depressing and you can have an opportunity uh, to fall into despair. And so, here is some hope for you. There is a way to build ourselves out of this problem, and that's what we have to do. We basically have to replace the entire energy system of the United States. Um, we do have to do conservation in the meantime, um, but ultimately we have to stop burning fossil fuels. And so this is a way to actually get to the point where we stop burning fossil fuels as a country. So that's the uh, program for tonight. And I put in, um, again, my name is Tom Solomon, just uh, so that you've got that out there. I put this little picture in the corner there because uh, one of the things I bring to this uh, story is my experience actually building a $2 billion factory for Intel and uh, the one in Rio Rancho. I was the program manager for that. And it turns out we were going to have to build a whole bunch of factories of a similar scale and scope as that one. So I have experience analyzing, justifying, um, proposing projects of this magnitude, and this is just a little bit more of the same. So here we go. What we're going to start with is some great work that's been done by Professor Mark Jacobson of Stanford University and uh, something called the Solutions Project. He is the director of the Atmosphere and Energy Program at Stanford. You can find his work on uh, a website called thesolutionsproject.org. <clears throat> and what he has done is analyzed all of the renewable energy available in the entire country, uh, which of course varies by region because, uh, for example, in the northwest and the northeast there's a lot of hydroelectric power. Uh, because of the rainfall and the dams that they have there. In the southwest, we've got a lot of wind energy um, and solar. Uh, the wind energy actually is concentrated really in the central plains, but we have some here in New Mexico as well. Off of both coasts, you've got uh, a lot of offshore wind energy and in the Gulf of New Mexico, geothermal uh, along the Rocky Mountain Corridor, wave and tidal off of both coasts, etc. So every state in the country has its own unique customized mix of renewable energy resources available to it depending upon where it is. Um, and what he has done is analyzed all of that available renewable energy and he's broken it down if you're interested into what's available for every state in the Union and I'll show you what that solution looks like for New Mexico later on. But if you aggregate that entire answer for the entire country, this is what you get. The renewable energy portfolio for 100% clean renewable energy is 50% wind, 40% solar, 3% uh, hydro, which is basically what we have today, 1.3% uh, geothermal, and a little bit of wave and tidal. And so we take that vision for a renewable energy future and then match to it a plan to actually build all of that renewable energy to get to that end point, and we do it in time to avoid the most dangerous levels of warming, uh, trying to avoid one and a half degrees C and certainly two degrees C, which is coming upon us relatively soon, okay? So that's the plan. The key messages that I want you to come away with tonight are that 100% clean renewable energy can be achieved with the current technology that we have today. We do not require any new energy technologies, any energy mir miracles. What we have to do is build what we know how to build today. And you can do that and pay for it with all the fuel savings that we will get as a result of no longer buying fossil fuels. And I'll show you what that looks like. And we will create lots of great jobs through the course of building out that clean energy infrastructure. And of course the result is going to be a future that is far healthier for everyone because we will no longer be breathing in all of that fossil fuel pollution. Okay. The questions to answer tonight is why is this so urgent, and it really is. How do we actually build out all this clean renewable energy, and what's it going to cost, and how do we pay for it? And then finally, looking into the, the situation in New Mexico, what would be our solution here in this state? 
So let's start with why 100% clean renewable energy. And the answer is that we are on a course of real disaster if we continue on the path that we are on. And it is getting very late to be engaging in a project of this magnitude, but it's what we have to do. The reason is uh, encapsulated on this chart. Carbon dioxide is the primary global warming gas that is warming the climate. It's the result of burning fossil fuels, the oil, the coal, the gas. Uh, all of that releases CO2 in the atmosphere, and we're basically digging up ancient carbon that was sequestered over the eons, uh, and we're putting it back up into the atmosphere, and it is a greenhouse gas that is trapping heat and warming the planet. If you look at the fossil record, and the record of uh, ancient air bubbles trapped in ice cores, we can go back 800,000 years and look at what the history of CO2 is in the uh, atmosphere. And it basically stayed in this range of parts per million of about 150 ppm to maybe 280 parts per million. And it never varied outside of that range for long before modern human beings evolved, which is about 200,000 years ago. Well, today, we are far outside of that range. We are over 400 parts per million per billion right now. Um, and we are beginning to see the effects of the warming climate of building up that amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The really terrible thing is that if we continue on our course and continue to build up more and more CO2 in the atmosphere, the forecasts are on that vertical red line, somewhere between 550 and 900 parts per million by the end of the century, which is really literally spends the end, spells the end of human civilization. Because we will no longer be able to grow the food to support our population. The warming is happening now. This is a chart from NASA. Uh, before 2015, 2014 was the hottest year on record. 2015 broke that in a big way. <coughs> hottest year we've ever seen, 2016, based on all the months records so far, is again on, on a path to uh, break the 2015 record and be the hottest year ever. And here is the actual data that's plotted um, in, uh, on the top of a mountain in the Hawaiian Islands, on top of Mauna Loa, where they get a really clean signal of CO2 in the atmosphere at about 11,000 feet. It's an instrument invented by Dr. Charles Keeling. He put it there in 1958. And that black line on the right side is the real-time data that they began collecting at that point. And it's just been rising and rising and rising. So when you hear that CO2 levels are 400-something parts per million in the atmosphere, it's that data that they're quoting. And I'm showing you this because you can just take a look at that curve and extrapolate it out just a little bit and say, when are we going to hit 450 parts per million? 450 is the level of CO2 in the atmosphere that scientists tell us is correlated to locking in a full 2 degrees C of dangerous global warming. And you can just look at that chart and eyeball it and see right around 2034, we will be locked into that point on our current path of continuing to burn fossil fuels for energy. Um, lots of other scientific papers have been published and done a much more sophisticated analysis than this, than this simple eyeball. But uh, they come up with the same answer, plus or minus a couple of years. So 18 to 20 years from now, we'll be locked into 2 degrees C of dangerous warming unless we do something about it. And what we have to do is stop burning fossil fuels, replace our energy system with clean renewable energy, and bend that curve over of concentration in the atmosphere before it hits 450. That is the task before us. If we don't do that, um, this is in detail what the U.S. Southwest would look like. Um, this is a chart page out of the National Climate Assessment that was published in 2014 by a whole slew of government agencies, including uh, NASA, the Department of State, the Department of Agriculture, the Pentagon. Um, and they came together and analyzed the data and said, this is what's going to happen. We will see 8 degrees Fahrenheit hotter average days by 2070 if we don't change, with massive impacts on decreasing surface water supply, which means drought, reduced crop yields, 
uh, heat waves, insect outbreaks, increased wildfires, flooding and erosion, everything that we want to avoid. So that's the future we don't want. Let's talk about the future that we do want. So how do we get to a future where we are no longer burning fossil fuels? As we started with, the, uh, the uh, solutions project from Professor Jacobson says we want 50% wind, 45% solar, and a few other resources. So we're going to do that. We're going to also follow the mandate from the Paris Climate Conference that says we need to avoid not only 2 degrees C, but try to shoot for 1.5 degrees C. And that means keeping over 80% of, of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground and buried. And we're going to do that and pay for it with the investment in clean energy that we'll be able to uh, pay for with about $875 billion a year that we currently spend on fossil fuels. That's what we spend on buying coal and natural gas and gasoline for our cars and kerosene and aviation fuel and every source of uh, fossil fuel that we, that we buy. Uh, the Energy Information Agency of the U.S. says that that's about what we spend. And in a clean energy future, we no longer are buying fuel. So all of that represents potential savings. And then we had a build-out plan to achieve that future before 2040. Because doing nothing and thinking that we will be able to keep our current climate is not a choice that is available to us. So here's some nuts and bolts. If you take... Uh, Jacobson's study and his projection of what the end use consumption for total energy will be in the United States by the year 2050, he says we're going to need to consume as a society 1,591 gigawatts of uh, power uh, for all purposes for the U.S. And that's not just electricity, that's power for heating, for industrial uses, for ground, sea, and air transportation, that is everything. So we're not burning fossil fuels for any purpose. But of course, in order to consume that much um, energy, you're going to have to generate it. And as we all know, renewable energy um, sources are intermittent. The sun is not always shining, so solar panels only generate power during the day. Wind turbines aren't always blowing everywhere. And so each one of those renewable sources come with what's called a capacity factor, which is the percentage of time that it's actually putting out its maximum output. Okay? So if you use those capacity factors, which on average for solar are about 22% and about 33% for wind, you end up scaling up this consumption and use need by about a factor of four. And what it means is you'll need to have nameplate generation capacity of about four times as much, or 6,448 gigawatts of nameplate capacity to install. Okay, so what's nameplate capacity? It is literally the number on the nameplate of a, uh, of a solar panel, for example, that says that's a 220 watt solar panel, which it will be on a sunny day uh, in August, right? But the rest <laughs> of the time, um, it, uh, it may not be generated that much. So. That's our target. We have to figure out how to build that much renewable energy capacity. And it breaks down into 3966 of solar, 2421 of wind. And of course, we already have just about all the hydro we're going to need. Uh, so we're just going to build a little bit more of geothermal wave and tidal. Okay, so that's the challenge. How do we build all of that generating capacity? Well, for the next 22 years, we're going to have to install, on average, every year, 597 million solar panels, 21,000 wind turbines, uh, for those costs of about 158 billion a year for solar, 125 billion a year for wind turbines, for a total yearly spending of 283 billion dollars. You add all that up over that period of time, that's 6.3 trillion dollars. It's a big number. It's also about what we spent on the Iraq and Afghan wars if you include the cost of all the returning veterans. So we have experience spending that kind of money and we know what the impact of the economy is and we certainly have survived it. So that's the challenge. And by the way, those are on average 300 watt solar panels and 5 megawatt wind turbines, which are some of the larger ones that are capable of being built today, but not the largest.
and over time they will become more average. Okay, so that's our challenge. This is what it's going to look like to build all of that renewable energy capacity over time. And out of the Paris Climate Conference, they basically said in order to have a chance of avoiding one and a half degrees C of warming, we need to shoot for 50% of this renewable energy capacity online by 2030. Okay, so it's 50% by 2030, 100% by 2050. It turns out, as you run these numbers and figure out how to actually build that much, if you install the production capacity to build all of that renewable energy at, at a rate of 50% by 2030, you just keep that, those factories running for another seven years and you'll be at 100% by 2037. And I'll show you what that looks like. So the previous chart was the actual growth in absolute gigawatts of renewable energy. This is a chart of the rate at which you're going to have to add that capacity every year. And if you, if you assume that each one of these factories that's going to build solar panels or it's going to build wind turbines puts out about a gigawatt per year, then that's also uh, the number of factories. And so you can think of this chart as the growth in the number of one gigawatt output factories that you're going to have online every year. We will get to the point where we have built 488 of these factories to build solar panels and wind turbines, and we have to build them real fast because they don't exist today. We basically have the ability to add 16 gigawatts a year right now for renewable energy, solar, and wind. So nowhere near the output required to get to the goal. But if you get to 50% by 2030, which is that much, you only have to build a few more factories and keep them running for another seven years, and again, you're at 100% by 2037. Okay? So on average, we're going to need to build giant factories at the rate of 29 per year for a couple of decades to get to this end result. 488 factories over 22 years. Okay? So here's some good news. It is actually going to pay for itself by doing this. This is called investment with a good return. And you can think of this kind of investment uh, at a larger scale, just the same as what many of you have already done, I think, of putting solar panels on your house. Who has solar panels on their roof? Okay. So you all know that you had to pay for those solar panels up front, or somebody did, and you put that capital investment up front, and then over time, you may end up with zero electric bill, or a very small one. And that is your, that is your uh, return, right? That's how it pays for itself over time. You scale that up to the entire country, and it's the same thing. We have to invest up front to put in this renewable energy capacity, and then the savings start to roll in. Because if we're spending currently $875 billion a year, uh, on buying fossil fuels, that every 10% of renewable energy capacity you put in is going to end up saving you $88 billion a year for the economy. Okay? And it turns out that somewhere around 2029, we will end up saving every year the same amount of money that it's going to take to continue that investment until you get to 100%. Okay? That's where the savings and the spending cross over, somewhere around 2029. Now, the net burden on the economy is actually just the difference between the investment and the savings curve. And the area between those two curves is about $95 billion a year. So that's what we're going to have to incur as an economic burden from now through 2029, on average, $95 billion a year. And of course, after 2029, the savings just continue to grow and grow as you build more and more renewable energy until you're at 100% by 2037, and then you were saving every year all of that $875 billion a year that you used to be spending on fossil fuels that you no longer are, okay? Um, this little tail at the uh, far right side is the spending that you're going to have to incur to replace the worn out wind turbines and solar panels after their 25 to 30 year lifetime is up, because we will have to do that. So where could this money come from? So uh, just a couple of proposals. One is to change the incentive structure for 
um, you know, private industry, which is currently, especially the oil industry, just wasting trillions of dollars investing in more production capacity for oil and looking for more oil reserves. Oil reserves that we cannot afford to let them burn because 80% of the known fossil fuel reserves already have to stay in the ground. So why are they spending trillions of dollars looking for more? Stupid. So if you, uh, you can actually look at this article, which I put a link to, um, in 2014, uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard wrote this article in the Daily Telegraph in the United Kingdom showing how much money the oil industry was investing uh, in foolish reserves, uh, looking for mm -hmm. reserves. Not a single large project has come on stream at a break-even cost below $80 a barrel for three years. So what's the price of oil today? Somewhere around 40, 40 to 50. So um, those are all money-losing investments. So if you put a carbon tax, which would be a tax on the carbon pollution represented by whatever came out of the well or the mine or the port of entry, um, it would then give the signal to the oil industry to redirect their investments, of which they are currently capable of making $5.4 trillion in, four, in six years, redirect that to invest in renewable energy. And of course, that 5.4 trillion that they wasted over six years is very close to the 6.3 trillion that we have to invest over 22 years to convert the economy to renewables. A second one that might be something we would uh, do to get you know revenue from uh, from the government uh, for doing, especially that upfront investment, that 95 billion a year that we have to invest, a gas tax. So. Uh, if you remember in 2014, we were all paying $3.50 a gallon for gas. Price of gallon has dropped down below $2 a gallon now. We could easily impose a dollar a gallon gas tax, and we would still be paying less for gas than we were two and a half years ago. Um, and you might want to, and that, uh, by the way, that gas tax, because we use 137 billion gallons of gas a year as a country, that represents a potential of $137 billion in income that we could use for investment in renewables. And uh, for fairness, what you might want to also do is pair that gas tax increase with uh, an increase in the uh, tax credits for renewable, excuse me, the earned income tax credit and child care. So that would offset the burden on lower income families so that it would be a little bit more fair. And of course, that $137 billion a year uh, would be nearly half of the total investment that we need to make in renewable. So there are sources of revenue out there if we just have the political will to get this done. So here's what the solar energy solution would look like. We need to invest, as I said, in building 3,966 gigawatts of solar. So that's going to take a bunch of big factories. The good news is they are building the first one right now in Buffalo, New York, uh, and that's what it looks like. It's going to come online uh, with production in July of this year, um, full production a year from, uh, from now, in the middle of 2017. It's being built by SolarCity. Uh, it's going to make some very high efficiency solar cells of 18 to 21 percent, which will be you know, 300 watt panels or better, um, and of course that is one, and we need to build 295 more just like it, okay? But at least we know what it looks like. Here's a great chart that I got off of uh, somebody's financial analysis presentation. They titled the slide, Welcome to the Terror Dome, because it, uh, it scares the bejesus out of the fossil fuel industry because it shows how the declining price of solar energy is absolutely going to... Um, beat out all of these other sources of fossil fuel in the marketplace. So it plots the price per million BTU from 1949 to 2012 for all these sources of fossil fuels, natural gas, coal, crude oil, liquid natural gas. And if you look at it, it was bumping along somewhere between 10 and $20 uh, dollars per million BTU until 2012. Solar wasn't even on the chart until 10 years ago. And here it comes, 
plunging out of the sky like an avenging angel sent to save us from the sun. And it is the price of solar on a per unit energy level is now cheaper than coal, cheaper than natural gas, cheaper than crude oil. And uh, it's got some of those people worried, and they should be. If you look in more detail just in the last few years at just solar, you get this chart. So the cost, the installed cost of solar energy has been dropping by about 7% per year for the last eight years or so. And it had been dropping previous to that as well. Um, and it was, you were seeing that 7% per year price decline at a time when we were installing less than five gigawatts per year. In this future that I'm talking about, this build out of 100% renewable energy, we're not talking about installing 5 gigawatts per year. We're talking about installing two to 300 gigawatts per year. And we're talking about spending $158 billion on the solar industry to do that. So you can bet that all of the solar companies are going to look at that market and say, I want a piece of that pie. I am going to compete on price. I'm going to keep driving the cost of solar panels down at least that fast and we will end up with a price decline that is similar or better than the 7% per year that we've been seeing so far. And that 7% per year is what I just forecasted going into the future to come up with those cost numbers that I showed you previously. So if we just extend this trend, 7% per year, that's what you get. We are already at under $2 a watt installed right now. And um, if you take this trend out into the future, uh, by the end of this build-out in 2037, we're at 50 cents a watt. And I think that is very reasonable. I think the only question is, will it take that long to get there? We are already seeing the solar market um, taken off in a dramatic fashion. The for market forecast for this year is we're going to see solar grow by 119%. Um, this is the market forecast from GTM Media, which tracks that stuff. So um, it has taken off already. And uh, that's the picture for solar. If you take a look at wind, we have to build out 2,421 gigawatts of wind energy. That's what that build out looks like. It's the same chart, except that it's just the top blue portion of it. But we're going to also have to greatly expand the amount of capacity that we have for building out wind. The most wind that we ever installed as a country in a year was 13 gigawatts in 2012. Well, we're going to have to increase that by a factor of 15 and get to the point where we're installing 193 gigawatts of wind turbines every year. Okay. That's what a wind turbine factory looks like up in the right corner. And also for wind turbines, the price has been coming down as well, not as fast as solar, but still a nice healthy price decline with a learning rate of about 19%, which means you double capacity, and every time you double, um, the price drops by about 19%. Price comes down because of price competition in the market, uh, because of better designs of generators and blades and electronics, because the wind turbines are getting taller, and the, and the wind cross-section of the blades gets wider, and the wind is, goes faster the higher up in the atmosphere that you go, so you get more production uh, per unit wind turbine, and that all of those things drive the price down. Uh, an international agency cost reduction study forecasted another 30% drop in price through 2030. Those are the numbers that I used, and if you just extend that out, you say that the installed cost is going to go down from $1.63 to $1.07 per lot. So, those are the wind numbers that I use to forecast the pricing. As we build out the renewable energy in this future, we're going to end up with much more employment than we have today. And here's why. Uh, World Bank's uh, report showed us that per million dollar of spending relative to the oil and natural gas industry and the coal industry, where you might get five to seven jobs per million dollars of spending, in the wind and solar energy industry, you're going to get between 13 and 14 jobs per million dollars of spending. So as you begin to replace fossil fuels with wind and solar, you'll get more, more employment and healthier people. 
the land footprint of doing this is going to be tiny. And this is surprising to a lot of people. Um, you think you install all of these wind turbines and solar panels, it's going to take up a huge amount of land. Well, if you analyze it, which Jacobson has done, this build out, this future, is going to only use up four tenths of one percent of the land area in the United States. And these little dots here show you the size of the impact from those various sources. Hydroelectric that we already have, uh, rooftop PV, 7.2 percent, but of course those roofs are by and large already there, so it's not an additional land impact. The biggest impact is the utility scale photovoltaic and concentrated solar power plants uh, represented by that white circle. Offshore wind, of course, no land impact because it's offshore. Onshore wind, if you were to count the spacing between all of the individual turbines at a big wind turbine farm, it would be that big yellow circle. But if you count only where the wind turbine tower hits the ground, the base of the tower, it's that tiny little red dot. So you add up all of these things and it's four tenths of one percent. And of course, the wind blows um, mainly on the plains. Um, uh, and of course, we like to grow corn and wheat and farmers love to put wind turbines in the middle of their farms uh, and they will grow crops all year long around those towers because they love the income stream that they get from the energy that comes out of those wind turbines. Okay. And you cannot ignore the existing land impact of our dependent on fossil fuels. From drilling and fracking for uh, oil and gas, to mountaintop mining and removal to look and recover coal, and of course what we did to the Gulf Coast with the Deep Horizon uh, oil spill. And so those things will, will go away and we will end up with a cleaner landscape based on renewable energy. So that was the picture for the entire U.S. Let's take a look at what the impact is going to be and what the solution would like look like just for the state of New Mexico. If you go onto the Solutions Project website, you will find a little infographic for every state of the Union. This is the one for New Mexico. And it shows the individual um, solutions for uh, sources of renewable energy that Jacobson recommends, various different flavors of solar, uh, residential rooftops, commercial rooftops, utility scale solar plants, concentrated solar thermal. If you add up all those individual pieces of solar, it's about 40% solar. He recommends 50% onshore wind. Of course, there's no offshore wind in New Mexico. Uh, but we do have some great geothermal resources. So 10% of the solution for New Mexico is geothermal. So it's 50% wind, 40% solar, 10% geothermal, and uh, less than 1% hydro. By converting to this future, uh, we'll be uh, generating about 30,000 jobs in New Mexico by building all that out. And to install it all, we would, um, need, we would need to install 213 wind turbines a year and 2.5 million solar panels a year. The cost would be about $1.7 billion in spending, and that includes the geothermal. And just by example, a gas tax just on the gasoline that we buy in New Mexico would pay for more than half of that, or $978 million a year. Okay? And that, by the way, is if we only build out what would be required to cover the energy that we consume within the state of New Mexico. Being the sunny and windy state we are, we should be building out way more and exporting this energy to other states to use. Because we are rich in renewable energy resources, and then you would multiply those jobs figures um, significantly higher than that. New Mexico currently is one of 20 states in the Union that are already at grid parity. And what that means is that it is financially beneficial to any homeowner to even take out a loan to buy solar panels to put on their roof, and they will be able to pay that back through the reduction in their electric bill that might go down to zero. So grid parity means it's cheaper to go solar than to just continue to pay your electric bill. Twenty other states are like that. 
in the country today. And because the price of solar, as I said, keeps going down at 7% per year, within just four more years, that 20 is going to expand to 42 states. And it will continue to grow like that because the price of solar is going to continue to drop as opposed to burning coal for electricity whose prices will continue to rise. Solar energy in New Mexico is also a great clean industry and providing some excellent jobs in the state. There are 1,900 solar jobs already in New Mexico in 102 solar companies. Uh, that industry is growing at about 12% per year and uh, they are really good jobs. $20 an hour is the medium wage for a solar panel installer. So not too many other industries in New Mexico that you can point to that have this kind of economic growth and benefit and impact. And by comparison, this is of course what the solar resources look like in the United States, really concentrated on the U.S. Southwest. The wind resource map in the country um, is concentrated in the Central Plains, but uh, in the eastern plains in New Mexico, we also have some really good wind availability, and that's by and large where the wind turbine farms are mostly going. Not all, but most, and that's where we should invest in them. As an aside, if you take a look at where we currently do wind um, turbine manufacturing in this country, it's really clustered around Ohio and Pennsylvania and around the Great Lakes. To our knowledge, there is not one wind turbine or a wind tower manufacturer in the state of New Mexico, which just seems like a travesty to me. So another great opportunity for us to grow the economy by investing in renewable energy. And then finally, the geothermal map of the United States. Um, Colorado's got some great geothermal resources, but in the Rio Grande Valley, New Mexico does too, and that's one reason why you want to install about 10% of our uh, renewables for geothermal in the state. If you take a look at all of the benefits of renewable energy to, this energy to the state of New Mexico and put it on um, one little infographic chart for us, we did that, here it is. Uh, clean energy can provide for New Mexico uh, all of our solution and it would be 50% wind, 40 solar, 10% geothermal. Uh, we talked about the jobs that we uh, have a benefit from. One thing we didn't talk about is the health benefits. And in terms of health care savings, we would save $2.4 billion a year, a year, in reduced uh, costs for emphysema and heart disease and all of those pollution-related deaths that we currently incur that are killing today 353 people a year in New Mexico. So those benefits and those costs are not even part of the calculations that I gave you. That's additional benefit. I was just talking about fuel savings. Health savings are on top of that. So um, getting close to the end here, we talked about how to build out all of the renewable energy that we're going to need for 100% future. But of course, we're going to have to change things on the consumption side. We will need fully electrified transportation, electric cars, electric trucks and trains. We will need renewable energy uh, transportation on the air and the sea. Uh, it might be from algae-based biofuels, of which there is actually a company in New Mexico called Sapphire Energy, and uh, based in Las Cruces. Or it might be uh, compressed hydro hydro uh, cryogenic hydrogen, which is what Jacobson recommends. We'll need to convert all of our building heating, cooling, and hot water to renewable energy. Um, and some great opportunities to engage in um, efficiency at the same time we do those conversions. And we will need a smart grid to interconnect all of these intermittent sources of renewable energy. Estimates for the cost of a smart grid are somewhere around $400 billion, so that would be something like $20 billion a year for 20 years to get us a smart grid. And then finally, the remaining investments in that 1% of renewable energy that isn't wind and solar to build out the geothermal, the wave, and the hydro. Okay? So in summary, we know that the solutions to converting to a new renewable energy economy are here now today. The barriers to doing it are not technical. They are purely political. But the need to do it is urgent. The resistance, of course, comes from the economic sectors that are going to lose their share 
of that $875 billion a year we are currently spending on fossil fuels. Uh, we know that the U.S. economy can handle that, those costs, which are comparable to the Iraq and Afghan wars, and we'll pay for it by uh, saving the money that we're spending on fossil fuels today. And there is no um, sugarcoating the fact that this is an enormous industrial challenge. It is on the scale of what we had to do to win World War II when we converted our automobile factories and our appliance factories from building toasters and washing machines and automobiles to building you know, howitzers and tanks and bombers and ships. But we did that in two years, between 1941 and 1943. And we can do it again. So let's talk about um, what you can do as an individual. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do to be more energy efficient. Converting your lighting to LEDs, uh, looking at electrified vehicles, buying Energy Star appliances and power strips that you could turn off when you're not using them. Go solar yourself. Consider buying wind power. Uh, get an energy audit in your home and um, get yourself better insulated so you don't waste so, waste, waste so much energy. Vote in every election for candidates who believe in climate science and are committed to take the needed action. And spread the word that 100% renewable energy future is doable, it's affordable, it's healthier, and it creates jobs. Support environmental groups that are fighting climate change. And think about divesting your 401k, because investing in fossil fuel companies not only gives them benefit, it is destroying your portfolio because they're lousy investments today. So. One thing that we are specifically doing uh, as 350 New Mexico, in conjunction with uh, the Sierra Club and Interfaith Power and Light and a whole other list of renewable companies, or uh, excuse me, uh, environmental companies, is urging this New Mexico State Legislature to invest the renewable portfolio standards all the way up as to where, where we need them, which is 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And we will be working with our legislators to craft a bill, introduce it into the legislature, and when we have a governor that's capable of signing such a thing to get it passed. <laughs> Another reason to vote. <laughs> so that's the end of my talk in the future, and we can do this. Thank you.